Nick Fury, Mr. Samuel L. Jackson. How did you feel when you donned that eye patch and became Nick Fury again in this film? Um, well, after reading this story, I, I, when I put the eye patch on this time, I was, I was looking forward to actually doing a lot more compelling things that I had done before, um, just because the story is a bit more complex, and uh, I was going to have an opportunity to do a lot more things. Do you think that Nick Fury should evolve much more or kind of stay where he is, where everyone likes him and appreciates him and knows what he's about? Or do you really <laughs> want to take him to the next level? Um, I don't think everybody does know and understand where he is right now. Um, there's getting ready to be, a, in my mind, um, a whole new evolution of where he's been and where he can go. Because he's, he's had to go back into the shadow world now. He's, he's been out in the real world for a while. Now he's about to go back into the shadows. In the beginning of the film, it's a couple of years past those um, iconic events that happened in New York with the Avengers. What has changed? You think it was a couple of years or a couple of months? <laughs> I'm just asking. Time, time is not my strong time is, suit. Yeah, okay, all right, all right, good. <laughs> good. It's well, been a while. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little break. Might have gotten a massage. Mm -hmm. What has changed in Nick Fury's world between then the end of the Avengers, and now, the start well, of this film. He's, he's gotten the S.H.I.E.L.D. initiative passed, and they're building these bigger, better helicarriers that he wanted. Uh, and Cap's still trying to find his way in this world, and he's starting to realize that the price of freedom has changed in terms of how people, how the government protects its people. They protect them with fear rather than with, you know, patriotism. Tell me a little bit about uh, how Nick Fury and um, Steve Rogers interact in this movie. Does their relationship change at all? Steve still doesn't trust Nick Fury, but he understands and knows that his heart's in the right place, that they're both patriots. They just come from a different era, maybe not so much, because nobody knows if Nick Fury was around when Steve was around or not. It's kind of hard to tell. But um, their relationship... It's semi-adversarial, but they both have a great amount of respect for each other. Speaking of adversarial, we have um, an amazing character in Robert Redford in this film. What do you think his presence bring to the, brings to the film and his role? Um, there's a certain amount of gravitas that comes along with you know having a character like Robert Redford in the film, even though you know I'm sure two thirds of the kids coming in the film are going to go who, uh, <laughs> and their parents will have to tell them. Uh, but it also um, sort of changes the audience that we may get for the film just because he's there, because they understand he has a, a certain amount of um, respect for the kind of work that he does and the kind of things that he attaches his name to. So I'm sure you know, we, will, we will get a new audience. But surprisingly, the audience in this film uh, it's going to have to work a little bit harder than they normally work when they come to a film like this. And uh, I think that's a good thing, but we'll see. It's absolutely a good thing. There's a really sort of 1970s political thriller yeah. aspect. Well, there's a real yeah, three days of the Condor aspect to this film. Now. Absolutely. And um, I think that really comes from what the Russos contributed and wanting it to be grounded in the real world. They didn't write this, did they? They didn't write this. They directed it. <laughs> Stop I'm messing with me. I'm just checking. Stop messing with me. Right. So what did you think about that, the sort of real-world grounding that they insisted on, and how did that affect your experience? Well, I insist on that a lot um, because I don't like sitting in films that you know aren't grounded in some way. I don't know about the real-world grounding, but once I know the ground rules of the world that they're in, mm -hmm. That I want them to adhere to those ground rules. That certain things can't happen unless certain other things happen. Or that if this happens, then that happens. And there's a rule that says, well, that can't happen because it doesn't make sense. So we were constantly trying to make sure that everything made sense in terms of what we did and uh, how they were connected. Um, and, you know, I'm one of those people that insist on those kind of things, even in, you know, that crazy car chase movie thing. Ideally, what do you want audiences to experience when they see this film? How do you want them to feel afterwards? What do you think they should take away, ideally? Well, I want them to be excited, period. I mean, I, I want them to understand that um, they watched a film that was 
about more than just things blowing up and superheroes fighting each other, that there was a political consequence there, that we have made a statement about the price of freedom and what it actually is, and that redemption is still possible. There's all that that's going on in here. And, you know, it's really difficult to have a great hero movie unless you have a really, really, really great villain. The greater the villain, the greater the movie. And um, there's a great villain. And the great villain is not just, you know, the villain that we see on screen. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah.